please remain standing. If you have your Bible, go with me to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 15. I just want to look at one verse. Romans chapter 15, verse 4. Now, whether um, you have a hard copy of the script or electronic copy or no copy, please look on the screen. Paul is writing, and he's trying to encourage the people to be unified and using Jesus Christ's example of taking something that you don't deserve. Sometimes you got to take ridicule and you know you didn't do anything to deserve it. Sometimes you have to forgive somebody that did wrong to you. Sometimes you've got to go an extra mile with somebody that won't even come your direction. And, and, but you, gotta, you have to be willing to do it not as if they could repay you, but that he would repay you. And he begins to uh, lift up Jesus. And he's talking about, don't please yourself, please the other person. Please your neighbor. Boy, I tell you, if, if we could get this down in our spirit, some of our families would be closer. Some of our marriages would be stronger. Some of our churches would do more magnanimous things because we wouldn't allow the divisions that happen with people to happen. And then he points to the source of the victory. He said, talking about the scriptures, such things were written in the scriptures long ago to teach us. He said the scriptures were to teach us and the scriptures give us hope and the scriptures give us encouragement as we wait patiently for the things that are promised in the scriptures. As we wait patiently for God's promises to be fulfilled. Today I want to speak from the thought, the schoolmaster, the schoolmaster. You may be seated. The schoolmaster. The schoolmaster. New beginning, we've been talking, and I've watched God do some amazing things. And I'm glad that he's not done yet. But the most important thing that we can do and we have done as a body of believers is to study the scriptures that we may find life through the scriptures, that we might find our source of strength, that we might find stability in our culture, in our church, in our family. The power of the scripture is to teach us, to instruct us, to train us, to prepare us, to give us a doctrine that we live by that God can show up and show out in our lives. The scriptures is the source of what Paul points to the church and says, don't forget everything that was written years ago, hundreds of years ago, for our instruction. This Bible is life's application Bible, not life application in the title but this is life's workbook we as believers are to study this thing uh, to show ourselves approved unto God workmen that need not to be ashamed that we would rightly divide this word I enjoyed all last week Friday, Saturday, Sunday especially Sunday 
I enjoyed it because it, it was to edify, build us up. And, 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 uh, but the most important thing we can do, whether I shout, whether I hoop, whether I sing, we need to make sure that we understand the power of the scriptures. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Faith cometh by hearing and then hearing by the word. It's one thing for you to hear the word from me. It's another thing for you to hear the word from him. The difference will be, yes, while I am speaking, your spirit will bear witness with my spirit. The Bible says deep calls into deep. But it's different when you hear the unctioning of the Holy Spirit when Pastor Campbell is speaking or someone else is speaking. But what happens when you get alone all by yourself at your kitchen table and you hear the voice of the Lord breathe on something you read? See, what God is trying to do, he's trying to give you a hunger and a thirst for the righteousness that's in his word. But so many of us have gotten so caught up in the entertainment of preaching and entertainment of people, and we make people, we make them some kind of, some kind of demagogue. We make them some kind of thing where we make them, it's like it's about them. And sometimes you can have a preacher come who has a big name teaching a small word, but because of the name, you'll get excited, and I'll be sitting there looking like, he ain't said nothing. What are you shouting about? God is not a respecter of person, and, and he, would use, he would use the scriptures but you notice that God doesn't go to any of the uh, theological institutes to find his disciples, the one that he would give his word to. He would go to the lowest of the low. He would go to publicans and sinners and tax collectors and fishermen and people who had no name. And he says, I can use you because you're not caught up in a name. Some of us got a name and we got a couple of symbols behind our name or before our name and you think that makes you who you are? The devil is a liar. God knew who you were while you were yet unformed in your mother's womb. He says, I knew you. I called you. I anointed you that I would send you forth to preach the gospel. I want to make sure we understand the schoolmaster, the schoolmaster. He says this word is your schoolmaster and I want to train you. He's real clear. Look at the New Living Translation. He says it this way. And, and, and in fact, I apologize to my team today because I didn't get a signal and couldn't send this out. But it, as it is, give me the New Living Translation of 15 and 4 when you get it. He's saying, I want you to know that I am giving you the scriptures. He says, whatever was written years ago, it was written for you. Somebody say, it's for me. No, no, say it, for, say it again. It's for me. He said, these things were written in the scriptures to teach me. To teach me. It, it, this is it's personal. It's to teach me. Put it up again, please. It's to teach us the scriptures to give us hope and encouragement as we wait for the promises. Some of us can't wait for the promises because you don't know they're in there. You don't even know what's for you, man. I get so excited because I look at his promises and he, his promises are yes and amen. He told me that if I, if I had the faith the size of a tiny mustard seed I could speak to the mountain to the obstacles in my life and I could speak to them that tells me that your problems can hear <laughs> sometimes you're speaking to yourself and you should be speaking to your problem 
Sometimes you ought to tell you, sometimes you're going through mental stuff and you ought to tell yourself, calm down, Rob Campbell. You can handle this. You built to take this. You can handle it. And you plus God, you are the majority. You can't lose with the stuff you use. You got to stand. It doesn't matter whether the world fades away, but his word will never fade away. And he's trying to tell us, huh? I'm trying to teach you. I'm, I'm, he says, he says, I'm trying to teach you the things that were written before. They were written to instruct you, to teach you, to train you. He says to give you a hope and encouragement. And we live in a world today where people seem to have no hope. This is the most depressed society we've ever. They're most. I, I'm not. Look, if, I, if you want some medication, praise God. I ain't talking about you because some of us need it, amen? And when I get a headache, I take an aspirin. If you need it, you need it. I'm just talking about some of us, we, we, you know, we, we got, you can't take nothing. You can't handle nothing. You worried about everything, man of God, woman of God. He, he, he. There are more folks on medication for everything. And then we're in a society where the young folks believe that, man, we might as well. We got problems because of what my grandmama, my mama did, what the daddy did, what they should have done. And we're walking around almost defeated, and we have a right to be so in our own minds. But he says the scripture was to give you a hope. And, and here's the thing. Some of us are, we have to figure out whether we're going to be uh, transformed, not conformed, but transformed by the renewing of our mind through this word. It, we have to decide whether we're going to be uh, moved by Christ or by culture. Jeremiah, he says, go down to the potter's house. And he goes down, and he goes down, and the, he says the potter has clay on the wheel. And, and many of us, we have to know that Jesus is the potter. We are the clay. Sometimes we are out of shape, out of form, but he's up to something. Sometimes we feel our world is going around and around, and it's all out of sorts. But he's saying, he says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. The word was God. He says, I am the potter. You are the clay. And sometimes through the word, he says, I want to shake you're different than what you started out he says I'm going to build you up sometimes and sometimes I'll press you down sometimes I will go inside of you he, David said search me oh Lord he says go on the inside and see who I am sometimes God begins to shape and mold us and he touches those hollow places in us and we say God I, I want you to take some stuff but don't go so deep sometimes it seems situations will move us all out of sort it seems to shape us different than we've ever been but God says hold on because I'm doing something he says we have this treasure in earth and vessels that the excellency may be of God and not of you. He says, I know what I put in you and I'm trying to get down on the inside so I can shape you. I took you down low so I can bring you up high. But because I took you low and you walked through the valley, I was with you. Now you know you can stand when you get on the mountain. Somebody ought to say yes. But you got to figure out if you're going to be shaped by the culture or by Christ. He says, I'm going to shape you. I want to shape you. All of these calamities, the chaos, the situations you go through, God is shaping you. Some of the things, don't you have to know that this trial is setting you up for your next triumph. Your current trial is setting you up for your next triumph. He says, I know what, he says, I went down on the inside. I, you found out who, anybody went through some stuff and you found some stuff in you that you didn't know was there. <laughs> Any, anybody ever went through some stuff and you did some things and you said, I can't believe. I can't believe. 
can't believe. <laughs> Mike, you know what I'm saying? It's like, you disappoint. How can you know? You disappoint yourself. He said, I didn't, I didn't think I would be that bad. Job was so bad. His wife said, you ought to cuss God because you going. You ever felt like you was going through so much? You ought. I mean, you ain't never felt like I can do bad by myself, God. If you ain't going to help me, you either with me or against me. We find out the word of God was written to instruct us, to, 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 to train us, to equip us, to shape us. What do you mean shape, Pastor Campbell? I shape my perspective through the lens of this word. He, he called me to walk by faith, substance of things hoped for, evidence not seen so he's already changing my perspective of how I see life I, you you see it half empty but because of my faith I see it half full I see something different because I'm I'm trying to look through the lens of the word you said somebody did you wrong you need to get them back and, and I say somebody did me wrong and God told me to give him my coat too he said turn the other cheek and I'm saying God The schoolmaster is the word of God. The schoolmaster, the instructor, uh, uh, he, he was called the rabbi and he would teach them and they would all sit down on the ground and, and, and he many times would stand up and, and sometimes he would sit with them so he could instruct them through the word of God. And, and so many times the disciples didn't really understand this instruction because they were caught up in the worldly kingdom and he was talking about a heavenly kingdom. And then many of them, that's why Judas betrayed him. Judas said, wait a minute, wait a minute. I thought you came to set up a, a kingdom here on earth. And, and Judas said, well, then if I put him in a compromised situation where he has to save himself, one of the things God does, many times we are in situations where you got to choose between your flesh and your faith. When we were doing the book bags, I could see it on some of y'all. Y'all was like, mm. he said, you know, if you got enough to buy one extra book bag, let me think. You know you already got your kids' stuff on lay, lay away six months ago. You got everything. You already got it out. But that, that greedy spirit in you, to me, hmm. Many times the trials are coming, and, and, and it, it, it challenges the word that we have. He says he's in the New Testament, but he's looking back to the Old Testament. He's in the New Testament, but he's pointing back to Christ. And he's pointing back to what Christ has done, not only in the New Testament, but he's going back to the Old Testament. He says, I want to instruct you in godly wisdom. Galatians 3, 24 and 25, it says it this way. I, I, I'll apologize to you so earlier because I got lots of scripture, but that's what it's about, right? He says, let me put it another way because he's pointing back to the law. He's saying the law was our guardian and some scripture says schoolmaster until Christ came. It protected us until we could be made right with God through faith. Watch, what, go on to verse 25. And now that the way of faith has come, we no longer need the law as our guardian. Give me the new King James version of that when you get a chance. He's saying, he says, the law was a schoolmaster. Before the law came, they didn't even know what sin was. So the law says, this is sin. The law said, you cannot covet, coveting your, your neighbor's wife is sin. It's wrong, don't do that. But until the law came, people thought that they could look at their neighbor's wife and lust for her, and it would not be a sin, but the law came and said, you can't do that. 
The law came and said, you must, you must give to your neighbor. You must love those who despitefully use you. The law was a schoolmaster, for it began to teach us how God wants us to walk. Now, here's, here's the thing with that. Look with me at 2 Corinthians 3, 5 through 6. New King James Version on that too, please. He, he begins to say, many of us don't understand that we're wrestling law against spirit, flesh against faith, culture against Christ. We are often battling this. And, and so many people who are still under the law, you, you, the thing about the law, it was a schoolmaster to teach us, but none of us could ever keep the law because if you didn't keep all of the law, you were still sinning. But the law came to basically teach us to bring in the borders of our life. What we find is God uses discipline to protect us, discipline to instruct us, discipline to mold us, discipline to equip us. The young girl that was here, I said you had to make choices in high school, but we also recognize when she get to college, she gonna have to make some same choices. Am I right? Oh, y'all act like no, you went to college and it was real easy. You didn't, you didn't never, you didn't never miss the mark this word is to train us it's, but we have to know that not that we're sufficient of ourselves to think anything as being from ourselves but our sufficiency is from our sufficiency is from our sufficiency isn't in the fact that I know scriptures our efficiency, sufficiency isn't in the fact that I have knowledge. Knowledge, if not properly applied, will puff you up and make you think that you're something when you're nothing. We find that he says, not that we're competent in ourselves to claim that anything comes from us. See, the word of God it's, it's quick and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword. It's piercing and dividing asunder. When I speak the word, when I release the word, the word is spirit. When you breathe, that's breath, it's spirit. When you speak the word, it goes forth to accomplish what it's set out to do. And I know that it's not me, it's the word of God in me and God. You. When I pray, I'm responsible to pray God is responsible to perform. I've decided I'm going to start praying for more miracles. Why? The performance of the miracle isn't on me. The prayer is on me. Many of us won't even pray and invite God in because you don't believe his promises. The scripture says, it says, Look, put that up again, 2 Corinthians 3, 5 he, and 6. He says, I need you to know, you don't claim, you, it, it's, it's the word of God. Not that we're sufficient of ourselves of anything being from us, but our sufficiency is from God. Who also made us sufficient as ministers of this new covenant, not of the letter, because the letter, it killeth, but the spirit for the letter kills, but the spirit, the, the, the letter kills, but the spirit, the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. He's saying, I'm trying to get you to the place to where you understand, you can go read this and quote this, but if you don't believe it, it's dead. But you can go read this and quote this and know that God is able to perform what he said he would do and life comes. He says, I'm a schoolmaster. I'm trying to teach you the 
principles and the promises I've laid before you and I need you to understand it's not that you can walk around quoting the law just quoting scriptures it's like he says I not only want to hear what you say but I want to see what you do he says I need I need to see my spirit in you he says because then I know you're mine he says, I need you to know it is the letter. Many of us give people the letter. That's why you can't give them grace. The spirit is a love. The spirit of God is love. He's a comforter. He's the paraclete. That parrot to come alongside. He comes alongside of us and he whispers us and he leads us and guides us. You've got to have the same kind of spirit that God has when you release his word. You can't be mean spirited and 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 and, and backbiting and, and doing anything you want to do. Your fruit don't look like the father. So when you speak his word, he said, I don't recognize that. I don't recognize that he says when you do that you're like sounding brass and tinkling cymbals because a sound and fury signify nothing he said I don't see, I can't I can't get I can't get with that you don't love people because they don't look like you you can't love people because you didn't go through what they're going through the devil is alive it had not been for the You can look holy if you want to, but I know, I, I, I know if your feet could talk, they would tell the story that you've been down some roads that you ain't proud of. You've been in some situation that you ain't proud of. You've been in some circumstances that you ain't proud of, but God, but God, but God. The only way I can stand here every Sunday is the grace of God. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning and I need mine every When you think over your life and see where the Lord brought you from, maybe you can show love to somebody that don't deserve it. Maybe you can give grace to somebody that don't deserve it. Maybe you can forgive somebody that don't deserve it because God did it for you. Y'all sit down. I, I, I thought I'm going to teach today. I didn't even bring a shirt. Y'all sit down. He's saying, I want you to know it's law versus spirit, flesh versus faith. This word ought to make, make you go through a metamorphosis. But too many of us are hanging outside of the cocoon wondering how come you hadn't changed yet because you stopped moving. You stopped moving. You should have birthed something by now, but you you stop moving. You're not a you're not a butterfly. You're you're not a caterpillar. You're just you're deformed. You're deformed. There's something that has not completely developed. Why? You can't grow in the word just by hearing me. It's a start. But you can't. You can't grow in the word by sleeping with a preacher. You, 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 can't, you can't grow in the word by listening to YouTube. We have to study. That's not read. You have to study. That's not paraphrase. You have to study. You have to rightly divide, dissect the word. Cut the word up. Cut it up. That's why we have so many carnal Christians. You got the name, but you don't have the character. 
You know Christ, but you don't know his character. You know the letter, but you don't have the spirit. That's why you can see it sometimes. Not that we have any, but you'll find a mean usher at a church. Just junkyard dog mean. Morning. How you doing? Blessed and highly favored. No, ma'am, you can't come in here right now. We got, we praying. Be still. Know that he is God. <laughs> mean spirited ministers. You can shiver and shake, but you can't take no time to love on people. Return a phone call. Do something when the lights aren't on. All you have to do is think of where the Lord brought you from. Anybody know I'm telling the truth? When I look back over my life, I thank God they accepted me in the church with all my mess. Too many times we want to clean everybody up. Clean yourself up. You can't. You got to trust God too. You can't. I know I'm not the only one that stayed in the world extra years trying to clean myself up. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to church as soon as I finish off this last case. Soon, as soon, as soon. I used to roll my own cigarettes and I said, soon, soon. Oh, come on now, don't look at, don't you judge? Don't judge me, it's under the blood. Somebody say it's under the blood. I ain't trying to glory in it, I'm trying to get where you live. I remember I used to rob God. I was like Pop Warmack. I give $2. I want everybody to see it. I'm giving. God said, you already got your reward. I wouldn't know that had Pop not told me. He said, Pastor, Pastor I was just like the. I, I didn't tell him at the time I was thinking I was too. I wanted to maintain some dignity. He says, I need you to understand the law was a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ to let us know. But then you move from law to spirit. And here's the thing. Some of us come in the church in the law. You come to church because it's Sunday and it's 10 o'clock. Now, most of y'all, y'all ought to be ashamed. Y'all get here at 1030, 1045, 1050, 1105. I'm coming down your street. You know, we got some 11, 11, 15. Let me just say it like I said, 11, 15. I got some folks who roll up. Now, I'm not talking about stuff happen, but every Sunday, every Sunday, tell me, I'm going to wait till this is over. I'm going to wait till the offering is done. <laughs> I was joking with somebody a couple of weeks ago. We were doing something. And I said, oh, man, we're going to be late. We were leaving lunch. And I said, oh, we're late, but I missed the offering. <laughs> I probably shouldn't have said that because I really was just being funny. And we got there and we didn't miss the offering. But I'm just saying. <laughs> he said, we're not competent enough to claim anything that it comes from us. But we have to learn the thing of the spirit and we have to minister in this new covenant, not the letter, but the spirit. Some of us can't even get past our letter of our title because you're an elder, because you're a pastor, because you're a deacon. You can't treat people right? Come on, man. Because you're a, a, a seer. Can't nobody say nothing to you now. Prophet. You, you see everything, but you can't see that, can you? Hmm. The thing of God is, you, 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 many of us are rooted and grounded in church, but man of God, woman of God, we have to be rooted and grounded in the word. Look at that, that's a blessing. That's a third of a book bag. I see it coming, Lord. We need to be grounded in the word. 
this is personal. This is not about your sister, not about your brother, not about your children. This message is about you. I mean, this is you. This is you. This is you. It's me. It's, it, when was the last time you had a little talk with Jesus? And you told him about your problems. And then you read his answer to your, the solution to your problem. It's covered in the word. We got to get grounded in the, he's a schoolmaster. And some of us come to school, but we won't study. You won't study. So everything that is delivered seems to reach you in the wrong, wrong way. Let me, let me see if I can help. I started talking about giving and giving the book bag. Some of y'all got real tight. You got that reflex. You didn't do anything. You just, you puckered up, grabbed your wallet and said, mm-mm, not going to happen today, Reb. Until you realize God is telling us something. He says, prove me now herewith. If I won't open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you won't even have room to receive. The reason that you can't receive it is because you don't receive the word. When you do, it'll loosen you up. It'll, yes, it won't be comfortable. Anybody know that God will move you out of your comfortable place? If he doesn't, you become anesthetized by your situation. You go to sleep because you get comfortable and you go to sleep. You stop moving and we're supposed to grow from one level to the next level, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. God is trying to do something, but many times we say, mm, I ain't going there. Some of y'all won't come to Bible study because that would be, that would require you to come out to church twice in a week. Just look holy. I ain't, act like I'm talking about your neighbor. Smile like it ain't you. Go ahead. Come on. I need somebody. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Smile at me like it's your neighbor. Don't, don't look at him. Don't cut your eyes. It's... I know what that's like. When I first got saved, I thought my wife had lost it. Start talking about tithing. What? So the preacher can drive a Cadillac and I'm driving a hoopty Honda. My car was so old they stopped making parts for it. I'm like, I said, Well, you going to tithe on what God give you? <laughs> Tell him I'm coming. <laughs> Start volunteering in the church. You going in on Saturday to clean the church? I'll see you when you get back. Then I found myself hearing this word, having my heart pricked. The word is a seed. It goes into the heart, the fertile places of our heart, and it produces a fruit. The word is a light. It goes into the dark places and it shines the light of God's illumination and revelation on the inside of you and all of a sudden you hear something and you hear it almost for the first time. Many of us have information but we don't have revelation. And God is saying, I'm trying to get you to open up your eyes to this word. See, because what God is doing, he's using today's trial for your next triumph or today's trial will be just another trial that you fail. He's trying to show us something. We must be rooted and grounded in the word in order to be grounded in the hope. He, he said to us in, in, in chapter 15, verse 4, he says, he says, whatever things were written were written for our learning that through patience or perseverance. He said through patience, the only reason you're going to have patience is because you're going to have problems. Because who needs to be patient in a paradise? You have to learn to be patient in the middle of a problem. He says, you'll learn to be 
patient in the middle of your problems. You'll learn to persevere. You'll learn to overcome. You'll learn to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord because you are grounded in the word of God. The word of God, he says, wait on me. He says, I'll mount you up on wings of an eagle. You'll run and not be weary. You'll walk and not faint. He says, those that wait. What do you mean waiting? He's saying, I'm doing what you call me to do, and I know you're coming to see about me. That's why I can keep on doing it. While I'm working, I'm waiting too. I'm looking. It reminds me of when I left my boys at a practice one day and they didn't they didn't have a ride home many people asked them hey you want to ride with us they said no because they knew their dad was coming though it tarry wait for it what causes me to wait is to know that he is not a man that he could lie nor the son of man that he should repent that his promises in the book are yes and amen and I can have hope in a hopeless situation cause I'm waiting on my daddy I'm waiting on him you have to know that this 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 being grounded in the word is not contagious. You can't just catch it from a service. You can't catch it from a preacher. You can't catch it from a person. You're going to have to set your hind parts in a seat or get down on your knees and then to call on the name of the Lord. You're going to have to begin to rightly divide this thing here a little, there a little until where you begin to look up and say, man, look at where the Lord has brought me from. He says those who hunger and thirst for righteousness shall be filled. Let me ask you, how's your hunger? I know you're thirsty, but not that kind. How's your thirst? If you don't have a hunger, there's no need to give you bread. If you don't have thirst, there's no need to give you water. If you haven't prayed and asked God for anything, there's no reason for him to move. Even a baby learns in time to feed themselves. My grandson, he's 15 months old. It is so hard for him now to let us feed him. Mm -mm. He wants to do it himself. He dropping stuff everywhere. I'm like, boy, get off that carpet. <laughs> feed him on the wood. <laughs> but, but, and, 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 and he's, and I saw him the other day, he was eating bananas. He was, we cut him up into little pieces. He, he, he just mouth, jaws just poked out with bananas, still putting them in. He's hungry. When was the last time you were hungry for the word of God? The more you give him, the more you give him of yourself, the more he'll get of you, and the more you'll want of him <laughs> we have to be willing to create new habits see we already have a habit that keeps us in dysfunction that's why we can go to a certain point and we fall I'm not the only one I gotta I, I gotta not be conformed but transformed by continually renewing my mind in this word Parents, we've got, to, we've got to do what the word told us to do. Train up the child in the way that they should go. Stop letting them choose their own God. You don't even let them choose their clothes. Stop letting them stay home on Sunday. When they get their own house, they can stay home. Some of you, I see some parents, are like, mm, mm. You're, you're not comfortable with that, are you? They don't need a peer. They need a parent. 
2 Timothy 3, 15 through 17. Paul is saying to Timothy, he says, I know what's in you. He says, from your infancy, he says, from your childhood, you have known the Holy Scriptures because the parent taught him to him. His grandmother taught him, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Jesus Christ. Look at verse 16. He says, I know what's in you. He says, all scripture, how much? All, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instructions in right living, righteousness. That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Don't you know that God says, I knew you before you were yet formed in your mother's womb. I know the assignment I have for you. He says, I need you to get this word on the inside of you so I can equip you for everything I called you to from the beginning. I never wanted to be anybody's pastor. Never, never saw it coming. It blindsided me. It didn't blindside my wife. It didn't blindsight the mothers and the fathers of the church, but I caught me completely by surprise when God called me. I was so depressed. I was depressed for three days because I could not deny the fact that he had called me in such a magnanimous way. I had to say yes because God knows how to get your attention, and when he does, you know it's him. Don't nobody have to tell you it was the Lord. When you hear it, you know it, but I found out when I look back, over my life it, all along the way he was preparing me when I went on Saturday mornings to clean up the church and nobody was there he was preparing me when I taught the choir when I when I did the Bible study he was preparing me when I did street witnessing and I didn't like it because I, one of the guys that went with me would stand on the street and holler at people I'm like man I don't want to be out here But out of obedience, I went anyway. And then when it was my time, ain't won't be no hollering out here. Be like, yo, bro, can I holler at you? Not now? Cool. Catch you later. Yo, sis, you got a minute? Yeah. So you know I'm, I'm Deacon Campbell, and I ain't trying to hit on you. I just want to tell you about a man that loves everybody. And I know you're coming out of the club and I ain't trying to condemn you because it ain't been so long ago that I was there. But let me just tell you, let me rap to you about Jesus for just a minute. He loved you so much, he gave his whole life for you, girl. If he had to do it again, he'd do it just for you. Now, I know right now you got your head bad and you're about to go home, but hold on to this card. And when you get home and you can't sleep, don't call me because I'm fine and all that. Call me because you want to know Jesus. <laughs> brothers if you don't get some confidence about who you are ain't no woman want you women if you ain't got any confidence about who you are don't no man want you if you all humble tell me I ain't that much well, then you probably aren't but I, I read in the word that you're fearfully and wonderfully made you're God's own masterpiece. You all that and a bag of chips. Oh, you ought to go. <laughs> you know, I couldn't do that that well, but that's okay. We sometimes don't understand why a good God would delay in giving us the things he's promised. Y'all with me? You say, God, you're so good, you're so awesome. Why is it that I'm still waiting on the thing that you promised me? Anybody besides me feel like God is taking too long to deliver on his promise? I'm the only, all right, thank you. Thank I got one or two. Thank you. Any over here? You, you, thank you, Tanya. Tanya, Tanya. Tanya. Yes. You feel like God, man, you but we don't always know why God does 
what he does. And, and, and he says, I have given you the word so you can be taught and you can have hope in what I told you. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who needs hope for what they have? So he doesn't give you hope about what you have. He has to give you hope about what you do not have. Why would we think that strange when he said we walk by and not by? So many of us, we don't see what God said. You need to know that you're in a good place of faith. Don't cast away your confidence. I'm reminded. Over in Genesis chapter 2, don't go there. Uh, God has created the heavens and the earth. And he tells Adam, Adam, it's not good for you to be alone. Genesis 2.18. He says, I need to make you a help me. But in Genesis 19, he doesn't give Adam the help meet. He says, from the dust of the ground, he makes all of the cattle from the field and the birds from the air. And he says, Adam, do this work. Wait a minute, I'm waiting on my promise. He said, Adam, go to work. Name all of them. Name every one of them. But he made Adam a promise in verse 18, but he doesn't deliver it into verse number 20. 2 and 20. He says, he, he makes the woman, and he, he, he says, Adam names everything, and then... He says, but for Adam, there was not one found to be a helpmeet. Look at 21. He says he brings the woman, he makes her, brings her to Adam, and then he says, Adam, name her. What was happening, God made him a promise. There was time that Adam was thinking just like you and I, when are you going to deliver on the promise you made me? Watch this. God says, I made you a promise of something. Then I told you to go to work. He says, you named everything that was not compatible with you. So when you finally got what I gave you, you knew it was the right fit for you. Sometimes you got to know what you don't want before you can know what you want. Oh, let me see if I can break that down. He says, he says you want to get married, right? But then here comes a bow-legged Jim. You know he's bad. He, he looks good, talks good, but he ain't good. He loves himself more than he loves you. But he knows how to get to you, so he says, I love you, and you have such a low self-esteem. You say, oh, he loved me. You hadn't stopped to hear what God said. You know that he, ain't, he doesn't know the Lord. He doesn't even claim to know the Lord. He'll come to church with you because that's what you need. You need to see him in church, but you need to see Christ in him. If you stay grounded in this word, this word was said, don't be ye unequally yoked. Stop making compromises to go and get something that God doesn't really want you to have. But God says, I'm going to wait to bring you what you really need. So are you going to kiss enough frogs so when you find your prince? You're a kissing frog. He's still a frog. You're kissing frog. She's still a frog. He said, if you just listen to me, I'd have told you what a prince looks like. It's not because of his statue. You need somebody that can get low, get low. Somebody that can pray. You need somebody that knows that I am the Lord that gives every good and perfect gift. You need somebody that knows me. How are they going to know you if they don't know me? If you say you know me and your word have you hidden in your heart that you would not sin against me, why would you compromise on God's word and think that God gave you something? If you brought friends today, I apologize. I was. He says, I need you to know that sometimes he delays. Sometimes he delays, and it doesn't make any sense. But here's the thing. Anybody can stand when everything is happening. Anybody can, anybody can, can, can shout and sing songs of Zion when everything is going good. 
you know, anybody, anybody, you'll get, you go hit the lottery. You, you ain't got no friends today. You will have some tomorrow. Because you got something they want. But can you praise God when you don't have anybody but him? Can you praise God when nobody seems to esteem you or see you like he does? Can you praise God when you've gone through the worst thing in your life? He says, because I've given you my word, hide it in your heart, and understand I'm the God of all hope. He says, I promise you that I will show up in your life. He said, but if you don't, he says, the fact that you've been in church this long and you're no longer hungry, something is deformed. Because a baby will feed himself. Why aren't you feeding yourself? Do you know that it's a trick? It's a trick of the enemy. I pushed my kids in school. Pushed them hard. I pushed them hard. I made them take Latin. They're like, Dad, why you don't make us take Latin? Nobody speaks Latin. I said, look. Mr. SAT does. I made him take calculus and Greek. I made him take stuff that I didn't take. But I didn't have a dad like me. I didn't have a dad that understood, not a dad like Saul who was jealous of his kids, but a, but a dad that wanted his kids to start where he finished to do better than he does. That's what God wants for you. He wants that for you. I'm not going to be able to finish. And I'm not going to try. I'll finish it. I'm starting a new series next week. Y'all give me just a little bit more time. A little bit more time. I have to ask you, what are you grounded in? What are you rooted in? How do you see the situations of your life? Can you have hope when you don't see it? Can you have hope when it doesn't happen? How, how many times shall you walk around Jericho? Or would, or would you not even try it because that's stupid? to think that it, you, you could follow God's instruction and if God is going to lead us why, would it, why wouldn't it work he said because without faith you can't please me I need to know if God moved every time you did it one time you would not have faith you would just say God does it that way I don't have to do anything but he says without faith it's impossible He says, even the way I deal with you, he says, if, if it's not rooted in faith, it's sin. What are you talking about? He was talking in verse uh, chapter 14 of Romans, right before 15, he was talking about all the rules and the religious order of things. And they were arguing and debating about alcohol or eating meat or the Sabbath. And he says, listen, if your heart convicts you, know that I am greater. He says, more importantly, don't use whatever is an occasion of liberty for you to cause somebody else to stumble. And don't run around debating with people who don't believe like you do. You can't win them like that. You can't win them in the crowd trying to undress them you got to know you win them with love but he was saying to them he was saying to them he says if it's not done in faith in other words if you know in your heart it's wrong baby for you it is and if it's right for you and they seem to think it's right for them then it's right for them and you don't put judgment on them you have to live and let people live For the men, I'm doing a study on alcohol on Thursday, but that's kind of where it's going to come down to because I can stand here and we can start debating right now and some of y'all going to walk out of here and still drink your fifth. Amen. And some of you all are going to still be teetotalers. Amen. And uh, we'll let the Lord decide. Amen. 
but I need you to know this. When you're born again, you're born for battle. And, and run over, run over to Luke chapter 8, um, 11 through 15. Uh, I'll put that up. This is the parable. Now, the Bible says uh, he had, a man had seed. He went out to sow the seed. And the seed is the word of God. You know, he sowed the seed. Look what he said. Those by the wayside. Some seed fell by the wayside. And I need you to know the seed is the word of God. Some of the words you get will fall by the wayside. People who hear, then the devil comes and takes away the word right out of their hearts. Least they should believe and be saved. And what some of us actually give up our salvation because something the devil says you don't know you don't know where that happened watch what happens when a lot of our kids go to college and they take that that history class or not the religion class and many of them will say uh oh oh it's relative it's many ways to God you can come through Buddha you can come through Muhammad. You can come of your own God. Make up one. I know I'm telling the truth. Put that next verse up. Six minutes, I'll be done. But the ones on the rocks, some fell on the rocks, are those who, when they hear and receive the word with joy, I see people come in here, shout, lay in the floor, get up, and then they have no root. They won't even come back the next Sunday. They believe for a while and in time, temptation, fall away. Here, don't, get, don't fall away because of temptation. Even though you fall in temptation, a righteous man falls seven times, gets right back up. Go ask God to forgive you again until you no longer fall into the same temptation. Give me that next verse. He says, the ones that fell among the thorns are those who when they had heard, go out and are choked with the cares and the riches and the pleasures of life and bring no fruit of maturity. I'm talking about maturing. Maturity. Maturity. Now, you don't have to compare yourself with yourself or others. You compare yourself with the word of God. Nobody's trying to judge you. I'm not trying to judge you. Judge yourself against the word of God. Because guess what? The Holy Spirit is there. There's no condemnation, but he will convict us, won't he? And thanks be to God that we feel some conviction because when you stop feeling conviction about, can't do nothing with you then. But just because you feel conviction, don't allow it to condemn you. He knew we would need grace every morning. The pastor too. First lady, as fine as she is, pretty, pretty girl. Need, need Jesus every day. She in the back with my grandson. But she needs Jesus every day. And her husband does too. Twice as much. Minister Paul and I work out at the gym, and I'm always repenting about something. He said, Pastor, you're going to make it into heaven. Because Paul's shoulders hurt, and I've been walking around telling everybody because I lift more weight than he does right now. And I'm telling everybody, look at him, big old self. He can't lift what I lift, though. And then, and then I'll say to him, I said, Paul, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done that. He said, you know, you've been repenting on this every week, once or twice a week. I'm convinced you're going to make it into heaven. I told him when I would do good, evil. <laughs> so if you fall, man, don't stay in condemnation. Don't. Did I get all of them? Come on then. There you go. But the ones that fell on the good ground, those who haven't heard the word with a good noble heart, keep it and bear fruit. With what? When you see patience, you see problems. Amen. You cannot live in this life. In this life, you shall have troubles. Don't, get, don't think, man, God, my life is all messed up. I got troubles. Yours are the only ones you know about. Because the person sitting next to you, as handsome as he is, as beautiful as she is, she got a bunch of problems. But she serves a God who's a problem solver. Y'all stand to your feet.